the Radical Secular Podcast, a demand for justice, equality, and rational public policy. Subscribe at YouTube, Apple Podcasts and all the major podcast channels. Visit our website at theradicalsecular.com for articles, transcripts, and our complete library of episodes. Support us on Patreon and follow us on social media. Welcome Radical Secular listeners, and happy Labor Day! Our team is off for the long holiday weekend, and we hope that you and your families are enjoying yours. So today we bring you an encore presentation of episode 25 of Secular Left with Doug Berger, featuring an interview with our co-hosts Christoph Defoe and Sean Prophet. Doug is a big supporter of our podcast, and he's also scheduled to appear as a guest this month, so stay tuned. And now, The Radical Secular presents, Secular Left. In this episode, I'm joined by Christophe Defoe and Jean Prophet, hosts of The Radical Secular. We talk about where they came from, how they got started, and what kind of topics they discuss on their podcast. We also discuss unjust hierarchies and how that relates to social justice and what is happening in our national politics today. I'm Doug Berger, and this is Secular Left. Uh, joining us today is uh, Christoph Defoe and Sean Prophet. They are the hosts of the Radical Secular, which is a podcast similar to mine. And uh, so hopefully we'll get some uh, questions and answers going and discuss some secular issues and find out why they, they call themselves radical, radical secular. Uh, mm-hmm. How are you two today? I'm good. Yeah, man, we're, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, I am feeling good, ready to talk. Okay. Um, let's, uh, like I said, your podcast is called The Radical Secular. Uh, what does that mean and how did you arrive at that title? And either one of you can answer it or you can talk over each other. That's okay. <laughs> well, um, so we, we started out... Uh, like many pandemic era podcasts started out um, looking at each other and talking about how unbelievably crazy this entire situation was um, between, and at the time, right, Trump was still in office. Um, we didn't know there was no good, we, and, and the pandemic was, was, was raging, but it wasn't clear that the pandemic would dislodge Trump, right? Because that's a lot of the reason why Trump it's not with us right now is because of the pandemic, right? Because he just boggled it so badly. Um, and so we were just talking one day and we're like, look, this conversation is really interesting. We're having a video chat. Maybe we should record it. Um, and so that is basically the genesis of it. Sean and I have known each other for quite some time, um, but we became friends. We reconnected on Facebook and I'll hand it over to Sean to sort of fill in some more details at the, that point. Yeah, well, I would say that both of us you know, came from a very strong religious background, mm-hmm. uh, grew up in, in what a lot of people would call a cult. And that really exposed, and by the way, this cult was started by my parents in 1958. And it became very large, predicted a sort of an Armageddon scenario in the late 1980s, going into 1990. And we built a very large system of bomb shelters to survive this apocalypse. And since that whole thing happened, first of all, it gave really both of us a front row seat as to the dangers of theocracy and religious thinking. And we've seen apocalypticism become so much larger now. It's it's a part of everything. I mean, if you look at QAnon, if you look at the Republican Party itself, you look at evangelical Christianity, they are constantly talking about these Armageddons, these apocalypses that are going to happen. It's going to change everything and it's going to remake the world according to their worldview. And what I think we sort of realized from that is that groups who do this are very, very much, they, they've, they've experienced a, a loss. The culture has moved on. The culture has, ha, has rejected them. And so the apocalypse is supposed to put that right. And, and what, so what that does is that makes them continuously looking to try to increase their power. 
and through governance. And, and so, so theocracy is what they want. They want God to be in charge, which really means whoever they choose as a representative of God to be in charge. Right. And it, it's, it's kind of the basis of all tyranny and, and hierarchy. And so that is why secularism is so important to us. And uh, do you consider yourselves uh, atheists, agnostics, or just believers who really support secular secularism? <laughs> atheists, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Atheists. And, uh, you know, I think, and we really make this distinction, right? Because there's a lot of atheists that run around and um, and yelling about why other people shouldn't believe in God or or whatever else. And really, I, I, I'll, I could speak for myself here, uh, and I think I speak for Sean as well, but I'll only speak for myself. Um, that is by saying, you know, I, I don't claim to know whether or not there's a God or there isn't a God. I just know that, it's very, that it seems to me very, very implausible. implausible. And beyond that, um, that's only incidental, right? Like, I, I, right? like, yes, I am an atheist, but only because I care about rationality and reason, right? Like, that's just a natural outgrowth of believing in facts and and science and things that are demonstrable. So, um, And so we're not around trying to yell at everybody whether or not they we sh- they should be atheists, but um, but secularism and obviously you know that distinction very well, uh, Doug. Um, but that distinction matters to us as well because we think that uh, freedom of religion is is really important, right? Like that is something that is a freedom that everyone in a free society should be able to choose to do. Yeah, and it's not um, it's it's freedom of conscience, really. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it extends way beyond religion. So you have to have freedom of conscience in a free society. And secularism is what makes sure the government doesn't get involved in privileging one religion over the other. Obviously, if you know the definition of the word, that's what it means. But but it's super important because a lot of religious people think that secularism is anti-religious, but it's mm. actually not. It's pro-religious freedom mm-hmm. by saying no privileging of one religion over the other, no official recognition and no official oppression of religion. Yeah, that's important. And uh, do you have like an overall viewpoint for your show? Like, do you have like ha- what you have in mind that you're going to talk about? Or is it is it pretty much whatever the current events are? I mean, are you trying to advance a certain viewpoint beyond the being se- uh, secular? Go ahead, Sean. If that makes well, sense. <laughs> I'll, yeah, okay. I'll take that one. Um, it comes down to what I was saying before about the hierarchy. Okay. And God being the top of the hierarchy, this is a a, a huge focus for us. And we look at unjust hierarchies. I mean, obviously society has to have certain hierarchies based on achievement. You know, a PhD is going to get more respect than, you know, someone else who's, who hasn't worked that hard or whatever. But we see people who are privileged by wealth, by race, uh, by gender, um, by sexual orientation, all of these things. And they believe somehow that they're entitled to a certain uh, superiority there. So I think we see it's not enough to just not believe in God. You, you have to tackle the results of, of how that works, right? Because we see religion has been involved in a lot of injustice throughout history. They, they didn't lift a finger to end slavery. They were involved, you know, in the Holocaust. I mean, it, it just you just go country to country and religion has not... Uh, been on the side of good in many it, 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 at many times in history, and so we're looking at that and we're saying it, it, this isn't about God. This is about human behavior and human hierarchies. And so we want to challenge these unearned and unjust hierarchies at every opportunity. And there's a lot of places to do it. I mean, we could talk about race. We could talk about economics. We could talk about corruption. I mean. Sometimes we include current events, but most of the time it is a we, we go in depth in a particular issue that one of us will do research on. Yeah, I think that's right, and and I think the th- the sort of thrust that is or the thread that is woven into every single show that we do is justice, right? Social justice, yes, but justice from the top to the bottom, right? Uh, whether that be an economic justice, and I think the bottom line is you cannot parse these things out from each other, really, right? They really are all the same thing, right? Martin Luther King is famous for saying, although perhaps not famous enough, for his economic agenda. 
right? His whole thing was like, yeah, you can't have real freedom if people. It's like it's it, it makes no sense. It makes no difference if people can if people can go into a particular store because it's not segregated anymore. If they can't don't have any money to buy anything in that store, there is no real freedom without that without uh, without that kind of uh, justice across the board. So I think that you know we definitely if something especially during the Trump years because everything there was so much so many crazy things happening all the time and not crazy like ha ha laugh crazy like terrifying things like wow is this it right and that, so so i think that during the trump era um to the extent that it's not all, it's not still the trump era which is a debate we could have but um uh, uh but i think that during the trump era we were more focused perhaps on sort of what was happening every day but as that sort of receded the the and and by the way like a like a uh, like the tide coming back and revealing all the garbage below. I think that's really what we've seen in the Trump era. With the end of the Trump era, right, is that now that the that the that the that the, uh, that the tidal wave of Trump uh, in office is gone, all the garbage that he brought to the fore has become abundantly clear to all of us. And so these problems are still very very serious. And then of course the George Floyd thing happened last last year, right? So like so these issues have been so 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 to answer your question, yes, we tackle topic topical issues, but we're always looking at it through the theme, through the lens of ju- of social justice, of justice and like Sean said correctly, hierarchy, unearned hierarchy. Where is the unearned hierarchy in this situation, right? What is, where is it in that situation? And I think that is what we try to do for our viewers and for our listeners. Okay. Um, and the most recent episode I listened to was, I think the most recent one you posted, uh, that you marked your first year as a show. How do you feel that your first year went? I mean, I, I think, go it, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I think it was good. I mean, it, it, we learned a lot and I think that's, we learned a lot about, about each other. We learned a lot about the production process, uh, keeping to a schedule, (laughs) um, (laughs) all of those things that you have, that that you appreciate as a podcaster that you have to do. And, um, it, I think it was, it was, it was a positive experience overall. I'm, I'm proud of it. I absolutely agree on, on, multiple levels right uh, Sean and I since because of the the church universal and triumphant background that we both had thought we, we knew each other um, but uh, but through and then we became reconnected through Facebook and also through some of Sean's uh, writings on his one of his journal he had a, a blog right he had a blog uh, years ago called the Black Sun journal and so and I read a lot of that stuff as I was making my transition from a very religious, fundamentalist, dogmatic uh, worldview and mindset that I that I was steeped in growing up. Right. Um, And so uh, so I knew we we got but we got to know each other way more and way better and, and for the better over the last year as we've gotten to know each other, not as just sort of face characters on Facebook, but as individuals. Right. And as people and with with uh, with all the things that come along with becoming a close friend with somebody. Right. So I think that has been a really important journey and a really good one. Uh, in terms of the experience of putting the podcast together itself, uh, what a challenge, and uh, especially in the beginning, figuring out what we needed, uh, investing in the equipment. But I think more than anything else, learning how to speak to each other in a way that was interesting and also communicate ideas that are hard to to, to, to think about, right. We're talking about stuff. We talked, Sean and I talked about this last night or the night before, whatever it was. And we're like, we're talking about stuff that is hard to talk about stuff that you, you mentioned earlier, Doug, that people getting people to come on the show is hard. Why? Right. Because like people don't want to talk about the stuff that we're talking about, but it's so critical that we talk about the stuff that we're talking about. Right. Like literally democracy is on, on, on the line. So I think for, for me personally, it's been this really great experience of, codifying, that's the word I'm looking for, I'm a lawyer, right? Codifying, uh, how else we want to think about it, but putting it, hardening, um, making uh, making it uh, official, the stuff that we were doing and talking about a lot for years, but making it something that can perhaps break out of our bubble and into the greater world. And so I think it has been a success. Um, we still have a long way to go and we will get there, but, I, but, but, uh, but it absolutely has been a success and a lot of fun for sure. Yeah, I don't want to pick up on on what you're saying there too, uh, Christoph. It, it, in that, 
the, the job of a secular podcast, the job of a liberal podcast or post liberal, as we like to call ourselves, mm-hmm. is telling unpleasant truths. And right. this is something that that we discussed on our last sort of behind the scenes call. And it is that the other side has a huge advantage because they are kind of pushing the rock downhill in terms of they create these constant crises and they literally make billions of dollars telling people the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And <laughs> that's their whole thing. Horrible, <laughs> it's their whole thing. And, and, <laughs> and at the same time we're, we're addressing liberals. We, we, we want to have a message of hope, but we're also saying, Hey, you know, the fascists are destroying this country. And how many times can you repeat that before it becomes a bummer? People just want to tune out, they, you know? And mm-hmm. so we're trying to reach people at the same time. We have a very dire message. Yeah. And so I think part of what we do is we, we laugh a lot on the show, right? Like, even though we're right. talking about really heavy topics and we're talking about, oh my God, democracy is literally hanging in the balance. But at the same time, we're like, we're also just messing around and and, po- and and just laughing at, first of all, maybe just the absurdity of the, of the whole situation. We have our, our, our T-shirt thing that we do, and we laugh and joke about that. We talk about Star Trek a great deal. So we do have fun, and we have a great time. And I think that is uh, – and I think that is – it's important, I think, that we inject that in that kind of stuff into our content because it is heavy. And we are asking people to sit down and listen for an hour – an hour and a half, two hours to something that is that that can make them perhaps challenge some of their own assumptions. Um, and I think it also and and, I, and we learn a lot from each other too. I think and makes and makes me challenge some of my own assumptions, right? And so um, I think it ends up being a good symbiotic sort of relationship that we have, and and challenging, definitely challenging. Yeah, and um, likewise, I feel like um, I can tend to I le- I learn from. Christoph, how, how uh, presentation, you know, uh, and I think a lot of what we're, what we're doing, I'm happy and content to talk about the problems that we have and, 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 and focus on them because there's a lot of detail that you have to get into. And sometimes I think that because I'm interested in the detail, I'm interested in, you know, policy, I'm a little bit wonkish policy, you know, stuff that is, that puts people to sleep. And, and yet I'm, I'm happy to talk about, you know, so we, we did an episode about money and I talked about money for two hours, you know, and, uh, it, it's like, it's a good episode. Everybody we, and, should go listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have to be interested in that. And I think that, that, that this is what, this is the challenge that we have as a show and as, as people who want to make a difference is to really make these topics, um, attractive. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of kind of like the viewpoint I have, kind of like the viewpoint you have, is that you're trying to offer solutions, mm-hmm. even if you don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you may have read a book or a magazine article or or whatever to suggest a solution to some issue. Um, and I just know from my experience on social media that it's easy to point out the problem. It's yeah. hard to suggest solutions and well, we can or, suggest them but right. you know, the pro- the problem is is that in terms of of policy the right wing has a lock i mean from the filibuster to the electoral college to the their majority in the senate um that that, that is undemocratic based on population i mean it just goes on and on the constitution set us up for not really being able to uh, for the will of the people not to prevail and that's something that we're constantly railing against it's an uphill battle for sure. <laughs> um, and also, th- I wanted to bring us up, and I sent this to you in the email the, mm-hmm. uh, earlier today. Uh, you know, I listened to the, the episode. Oh, here's the title The Vile Pseudoscience of Charles Murray. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And I loved that because <laughs> I, had done, I had done an essay about the, uh, the bell curve 20 years ago for oh. my blog. And, uh, and so, you know, I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's a good guy. I think he's got crappy data. <laughs> he cherry picks and, and uh, ignores stuff that doesn't fit his little agenda. And, and you pegged it just like I pegged it, that it's like, okay, even if this is true, what does he want to do? 
That's where you need to look. Exactly. Exactly. That's where it gets yeah. scary. That's where it gets yes. scary really fast. Because it's like, okay, yes. let's assume for the sake of argument that everything you're saying is true, Charles Murray. Then what? Right? right? Just let them die? Is that your answer? Because that kind of is what it sounds like. And there are plenty of people, and I know I don't tell the two of you this, because I know don't, I know I don't tell Sean this, because literally <laughs> you have been interacting with people on YouTube recently based yeah. on the, oh, based yeah. on our episode. And it's like, there's a lot of people out there that are, be, would be happy to hang their head, to uh, hang their hat on this Charles Murray stuff to justify horrible things, absolutely mm-hmm. horrible things. And we know that is true, right? We yeah. And, they, and they go, they go, what are you going to do? It's true. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it what, doesn't what matter. Of, what kind of answer is that? <laughs> right. It doesn't matter if it's true. It doesn't no. matter. <laughs> Yeah, so this I, is, it, it really comes down to um, because the conclusion of social science is that if you want best outcomes, you have to give more help to people who mm-hmm. are struggling. OK, mm-hmm. and this is, I think, a lot of the sort of right libertarian um, white guys, you know, <laughs> are are on this kick where it's just like it's just science, bro. Like, I mean, Ugh. this is just you can't you can't argue with science. And I said to one guy who was getting on our case, I said, I said, look, this guy is literally calling for ethnic cleansing of cities. He said in his book that we need to replace the population through gentrification. Okay. And the guy I was talking to was like, that's not what he means. It's like, well, that's what he said. You know, and this is, this is the problem is that when you get into arguing with people who are dishonest, intellectually dishonest, Mm -hmm. they will literally tell you that what a person said is not what they meant, even if it's in plain English. And I asked the question, if that's not what he meant, where does he think those people are going to go? Yes. yes, Where are they supposed to go? Exactly. And we asked this question in the, we asked this exact, we posed this exact question in our episode. It's like, but then what, and it, it, where are these people going to go? I mean, and like you said, to your point, Sean, they just keep moving the goalposts, right? Because yeah. so, so there is no basis for argument, which is like fascism 101, right? Like, right. What the word means isn't what the word means, right? Like, so then you get to, you know, an anecdote, I, it, it reminds me of a conversation I had on Facebook, somebody, which I'm sorry, on Instagram and I'm fond of saying Instagram is a hotbed for terrible, terrible ideas. And the problem with it is that you go to like a meme and I like memes. Memes are funny. But the problem with that, like everybody thinks memes are funny, funny, including right wing lunatics. And so it it puts me outside of my normal little bubble of just like progressives that I see on Facebook or whatever. So and that, so there was one uh, episode about um, there was a, um, a meme about Michelle Obama and immediately the right wingers came. And they started calling her transphobic like, you know, she was she's trans. She's a guy. Da, 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 da. And I made a couple comments in, re- in reply and the vitriol that I received, and I usually don't do this because because of this, but the vitriol I received and the hate, and then of course, it's just like people were ins- insulted. Someone went into my direct messages, actually, to just berate me, and 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 the guy was obviously racist. I could tell by the way he was talking. He didn't say anything explicitly racist because they rarely do, but it was clear that he was racist to me. Um, and you know, and then he says, what are you talking about, man? It's just a joke, bro. It's just a joke. It's just a joke, bro. And that's been that, that's why I'm bringing, I'm bringing that up because that reminds me, Sean, of what you're saying, which is just like, no, what are you talking about? That's not what I mean. That's not what he means. Right. It's the, 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 it's just a joke is a variation on that same idea. It's like, no, no, no. What I'm saying is not what I mean. So you don't, you know what I mean? And again, it's just moving the goalposts. It's bad faith. Um, and it's infuriating get the sense in your show that generally for these episodes you two pretty much have the same viewpoint on things uh but was there a time where you didn't agree about a topic and how did you deal with that disagreement if you had one if that makes sense want to go ahead i mean i'd say uh, i'd say that that we have a very similar approach to justice. However, there have been some definite uh, points of disagreement um, over the course of the last year, over the course of as we were presenting these issues. And I think one of those was on how we deal with the topic of, for example, black people who seem to be betraying black people, the cause and the well-being of other black people. And 
I think that was there was a issue that went back and forth about Senator Tim Scott and his response to Biden's State of the Union speech. And I had called him some choice words and we we had a whole episode about that and about kind of my evolution of starting to understand how as a white man, me saying those words could, could hurt, um, hurt black people. And that is exactly the opposite of what my intent was. Right. And so it's really kind of peeling back the layers of, of the nuance of how we approach this. And I think that, um, I think that that's one of, one of our strengths is that we can get through those sorts of disagreements that might tear people apart um, with understanding and with humility. And I think that that's, that's gone both ways. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Christoph. And- yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I, that, yes, is the answer to the question is yes. And I think is because is that I think that any working relationship, or, but uh, beyond a working relationship, right? Like Sean and I are friends beyond just working a working relationship, right? So um, any relationship like that, when we do work closely together all the time, a conflict is as is inevitable. And in particular, and I'll just speak uh, briefly to the Tim Scott issue, like what what the issue was, was for me, and I talk about this a lot on the show over the course of the episodes, and th- is that my experience as a black man is 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 quite different than the typical black man's experience, right? So I grew up in a white suburb. I went to good schools, right? I didn't. I, I had I had a lot more access and privilege than the than the run of the mill sort of you know point a finger and point at a black person, right? The odds are low that this person went to uh, uh, went to a, a law school, right? And I know this by the way because black men are comically underrepresented in the legal profession, like comically underrepresented. Black women are are on the up and up and up like all the time, but black men are not. Um, so, um, and so from that experience, m- my experience is that I have been, I understand how white supremacy operates and infects the minds even of black people, right? And so, and, and, and that's the lens through which I, was suggesting that we talk about Tim Scott, right? Because Tim Scott is a victim of white supremacy in the same way that every other black person is. Now, his response is beyond the pale, right? Like, and we should absolutely criticize what he says. We should criticize what he does. We should like relentlessly. But what we shouldn't fall into is to is is um, is stereotyping or 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 negative names or anything like that because then we are just basically because again at the end of the day he is a black person too right and he is oppressed by the white supremacist system and by the way we like and this is something Sean and I talked about extensively and that is like white supremacy infects us all right it's a system that is woven into who we are as people and that is sort of what we're up here to fight against so so sometimes we come on these sort of these sort of issues where we're like, oh, we have different takes, but largely we agree on these things, I think. I mean, I, I do think that um, Sean's approach could be a little bit different. The way he talks about things can be a little bit different um, than the way I talk about the things. But at the, in terms of the actual substance of what we're talking about and how our, our conclusions about what about about it, I think they tend to be pretty pretty similar, um, and and we we don't want it to be like a crossfire type show, right? Like that right. is not that is not what we're what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I hate I hate those kind of shows. No, nah, it's just like come on, you know. Yeah. Just, that's just why pop, that's why pop. I don't. <laughs> That's why I don't watch those uh, football pregame shows anymore. Oh, just a whiff. I don't care. I don't care what you think. You haven't played the game in 12 years. I don't care what you think. Just give me the game. Give me a score. Show me a highlight. That's right. You know, because what they're doing is like ginning up conflict. You know, like what, like when you, when like my my wife likes to watch some of those like reality, she likes like Chopped, mm-hmm. the reality TV show, yeah. and they're just making up conflict for the sake of making up conflict. And it's like, you right. know, if come on, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same thing like those pregame shows for football. You're like, come on, yeah. guys, with your big fat ties and you're like, like outrageous outfits, and you guys are just yelling and screaming at each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of those types of conflict shows also. Um, first of all, they are theater, and I yes. think the guys might you know have a beer together afterwards and laugh for about sure. it. But, for sure, but the but the other <laughs> other side of it is is that the the arguments they're putting forward a lot of times are not in good faith. 
you know, or right. one side, the right, the right wing is not are ever arguing in good faith. Right. So <laughs> like yeah, the remember Hannity and Combs, remember Hannity and yeah. Combs back yeah, in least, the early two thousands or whatever. Yeah. At least they had a left viewpoint on there though. I mean, that, I, but, I think Fox has but, gone downhill. <laughs> but liberals yeah. complained about Combs constantly, yes. constantly, 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 because he never went after Hannity. Nope. Never. He, he was always submissive. Always. Well, and this is a tone, submissive. It's the tone conversation, right? right? You know, that liberals have to be, have to always be nice and never go for the juggler. And it's like, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. For more information about any of the topics covered in this episode, check out our show notes at secularleft.us. But I was going to mention you brought up uh, Tim Scott. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a, a senator, correct? From correct, senator from South Carolina. Carolina, okay. Junior, junior senator um, from South Carolina. And, and what you were saying, I was watching a documentary. Uh, was it just last night uh, about uh, uh, black actors and actresses in Hollywood and mm. how they were treated? And they were talking about Lena Horne, mm. and she was the first African American actress to sign a long-term contract with a studio in the 40s, 1940s. Wow, I can't even imagine. And then, <laughs> yeah, and oh then people God. like uh, people like uh, uh, Hattie McDowell, who played mm. Mammy and Gone with the Wind, and some mm. other black actors, complained because they were afraid that because she got a part and she didn't have to play a maid, that they were going to lose jo their job. Wow. You know, so it, it's like that. It's it's like, you know, she's doing something good for the community to get out of that stereotype. Mm -hmm. But you have people that are like, hey, wait a minute. Yep. You mm -hmm. know, it's like it's the point. I think I think that's a great example. And I think it's this is complicated. Right. It, it when we try to boil it down to like black or white, yes or no, when it, and sometimes things are really that simple. But when it comes to the intricacies of how white supremacy impacts, and I and I will say this, I, I use this example on the show that we talk about this, and and you've I, you've I know you've heard it, Sean, you've probably heard it too, Doug, and that is, you know, there uh, a famous exp experiment when the black child is asked to point to which doll. She's a black doll and a white doll in front of her. Which one is bad, right? And black girls consistently point to the dark doll and the point and my point is like this stuff is really ingrained and and it it's hard for a lot of folks to wrap their mind around how that could be inside the mind of a black person right how could a black person mm -hmm. think badly about another black person or think badly about themselves but this just goes to how insidious this is right and it's it's very complicated so when i look at tim scott i'm like i shake my head i'm like Brother, they got you, man. You you are sick. Like that's how yeah. I look at it. It's yeah. like a drug addict. Like you are sick, bro. Like that's how and like and I think that is the 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 the, the correct approach from uh, on that. And and black people from I mean, I I used to be one of these one of these black people who'd walk around and say, "Oh, black people need to take more care, take better care, take take things more seriously and and be, you know, back in my old rather conservative fundamentalist days, right? Like and so I understand Tim Scott. My my essay that I wrote on this was called I am Tim Scott because I'm trying to comp to, to to I was trying to communicate how easily this happens. It happens especially mm -hmm. if you grew up around all white people, which Tim Scott clearly did. Right. So, um, so anyway, so to, to sort of, I, I think I, I just wanted to comment on that, I guess. <laughs> and I, I wanted to bring, I wanted to also add something to that. And that, that is that when we start thinking about racism in the United States, we, we see it as, you know, two sides, you're either racist or you're not, um, you're either, you're either for justice or you're against justice. And it tends to make both groups very monolithic. And mm. I think that what a lot of people don't appreciate is, like the example you brought up with Lena Horne uh, mm -hmm. and this other actress, uh, intergroup conflict exists within the black community. Right. I mean, and, why, and how could it not? You know, how could it not? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, That's uh, a very good point. <laughs> well, and I think power is really the lens through which we see everything. There are so many, um, 
so many liberals who want to look at everything in terms of ethics. Like we have to be ethical. We have to be, ah, yes. Uh, and, yes. And, and, and the fact is, is that a lot of times ethics are a pretense, particularly religious ethics. Mm-hmm. And when, when we think about why we're secular, it's because we want to, we want to be honest about our motivations. And it, it seems that the, the, the most dishonest fronts are coming from religion. And then maybe next after that, like right wing politics. But it's it's like it, it, it's all ways of disguising that the true agenda is power uh, of disarming people. And so we want to we want to be honest about that. We want to get to the core of what is driving groups and people to do what they do. Yeah. And ironically, uh, not ironically, but interestingly, perhaps, is that uh, you know, Trumpism has a uh, Trump and Trumpism has laid bare the right wing strategy, right? Like any pretense of it being about uh, pulling yourself up uh, by your bootstraps, any pretense of it being about n- about <laughs> cutting government spending, any any pretense about it being about moral morality has gone completely out the window. Like it's always, and we know that it's always been this, but now there's yeah. no pretense anymore. Now it is purely about achieving and defending honor and power. That's it. Whether it's, or whether it's earned or not, frankly, just defending one's the position of power, um, democracy be damned, right? This was the people who were like, oh, we're, they were waxing poetic during the 90s that, that, uh, that, that Clinton was destroying the fabric of the nation. And then come on, come on, right? Like now it's like we know that was all BS. It was BS then, it's BS now, and we all know it now, you know? Yeah, and the, um, I, I get a uh, perverse chuckle uh, mm-hmm. with that recent uh, – uh, news about the congressman that wants to identify who the Capitol police officer was that killed that woman during the yeah. insurrection. <laughs> right. You know, like they're worried about law and order. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know, comical. comical. <laughs> they want to prosecute somebody for be, for killing somebody during an insurrection. It. Right. Right. And by the okay. way, don't care about the police officers that are killing people all the time. Right. Like that's right. a non-issue. That's, yeah, that's, that's, a that's, issue. A, that's it a, won't even do right. <laughs> they wouldn't vote to set up a commission to investigate. Like, right. don't you think if if they had if they had supported a commission to investigate uh, the insurrection, don't you think that that would have come out? Like, they'd be looking into all aspects of exactly. it. Exactly. Right? So on the one hand, they don't want to look at it, but then they want to look at it when it's 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 like, and and I compare it to Benghazi. Okay. Oh I mean, God, Benghazi. Remember yeah. Benghazi? Oh on, my you know? God. <laughs> Benghazi. I forgot about Benghazi. Yeah. That was Two what years. a sham. Two years, Two years. millions yeah. and millions of dollars, just complete witch hunt, right? A witch hunt. And this goes to show, right? Like, it's like, you know, how Trump continues to say that it's a witch hunt. It was a witch hunt. It was a witch hunt. But it's like saying exactly what they're doing, that is right, blaming you for doing exactly what they're doing, right? Which is just like, right. it's, it, you know, anyway, bad faith, bad faith all around. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're I, good at it. They're good at it. I mean, they they're did, very course, good they at it. it. They're very good at it. They want to be able to muddy the waters, just like you said. We talk, it, Sean. You say this a lot on the show as well, which is just like it's why it's so much easier to be on the right because all you have to do is destroy things, right? All you have to do is just obfuscate. You don't have to come up with anything new. So basically, all you have to do is make is put out there. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the perfect example of the most like egregious example is is the big lie, right? Like it doesn't matter if there's no evidence for it. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is put it out there on the airwaves, and there's enough people that are going to believe it, uh, mainly because they don't believe what comes out of they don't believe experts they don't believe they don't believe facts they don't believe judges they think and they get to and they believe that they can believe whatever they want you know it's like it's it's a life raft okay all all the right wing has to do is throw a life raft to these people and they grab they all grab onto it because true their 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 (laughs) worldview is sinking the 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 religious theocratic um fascist worldview um that is not fact-based i mean they're, they've been wrong about everything. They're wrong about climate change. They're wrong about race. They're wrong on everything. And so they just need a life preserver and they'll grab onto it. And that becomes the cause. It's a great analogy. It's a great analogy. Um, now the CRT, right? Crit- critical race theory. You, you, I, I listened oh, to yeah. your, another one. Yeah. I listened to yeah. your show on that. Uh, listen to your show on that, Doug. I thought it was really good. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's any boogeyman. Any boogeyman, mm-hmm. um, and 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 we, I think we talked about this, Sean, recently. And like, like you, CRT was uh, something else before it was that. It was um, 
it was uh, what well, was wokeism, I guess. And then there's before wokeism, oh, yeah. but they, they have a different politically name. For the, correct. Politically correct. That's politically what it was. Correct. Politically correct. <laughs> that was what it was before that. So it's basically it's all the name for the same thing. Progress, basically, right? Change, anything mm -hmm. that's yeah. justice, change, justice, change, any of that. Right. And, and see, and their whole point when they bring up the this culture war stuff is basically they're upset because they can't use the N-word whenever they want to mm -hmm. and not suffer any consequences. <laughs> exactly. Or, mm -hmm. or the C-word to women. Right. Or mm -hmm. pinching butts or grabbing pussies or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, what kind of world do you want to live, live in? Right. That's not... We know. We know what kind of world they want to live in. <laughs> but that, but, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good point, Doug, though, because it, it gets back to the Charles Murray thing, which is like, I don't think that... Cause yes, there are folks that are like hardcore right-wingers and just really just genuinely terrible people, um, but most people are just not thinking it through, right? They haven't thought through the logical consequences. Because I don't think that if you went to most people's door and they said, you think that your neighbors across the street... Middle Eastern, black, whatever, deserve to literally die because they can't afford X, Y, and Z? And the answer to their question would be no, but they don't understand how what they believe and vote for and support leads to that outcome, right? And, the, and that's where the obfuscation comes in. Obfuscating that is like what the entire GOP method message has been for at least thirty years, which is basically at since, least at least since Reagan. At least right? since gold. Well, really, since Goldwater. Right there, you go. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, yes. Since Goldwater, great point. At least, at least, at least. <laughs> I want to bring something up about this, and that is that uh, there's a there's a new book I'm reading, um, and it's called The Sum of Us, and I think it's we're going to take this up on a future episode at some mm -hmm. point, but it's by Heather McGee. And she is a black attorney who was the president of this organization called Demos, which is a, uh, I don't know exactly what they do. They're a research think tank, liberal uh, think tank, whatever. And they, they do a lot of, of, of demographic uh, work, obviously, by the, by the title. But anyway, what she says is that white supremacy and racism has hurt white people more than they can possibly imagine. Mm. And she starts out the book with the example of the fact that most American cities used to have a swimming pool, public swimming pool that they were very proud of. Um, they put a lot of money into building these things. The government paid for it. Um, they were built by taxpayers and they were public, but public meant white people. And so when desegregation started and civil rights act came in and this was before 1964 this was this was going on in the 50s and the mm -hmm. late 40s even where these pools I, I guess some of some some black people were suing under state civil rights law mm -hmm. to be able to have access to these these pools before before the national civil rights act happened anyway the point is is that these cities closed their pools rather than integrate and they had the exact same kind of riots and insanity going on back then where people with you know White people were showing up at these pools with clubs uh, and 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 knives. Acid. To make sure that they yeah, pour acid yeah. into the pool. Yeah, stuff like that. And and so the idea being that they wanted no one to have it rather than to share it. And that is what she goes through this analogy, um, going through all different aspects from the housing situation, redlining, you know, going on and on and on through how white people were hurt the same subprime loans that were tested originally on black people. And then they were brought and they were brought into, you know, to the larger society and oh, interesting. white people have suffered enormously because of white supremacy. And it has blinded us to the class, the real problem, which is class in this country. And so this is something that we are going to, going to take up a lot, you know, going forward onto, onto the show, because I think that's something that, I mean, we're, we're suffering. We're suffering now. The economy is suffering because of these policies. And, and this is what and, and even Republicans don't want. It. Like if you poll Republicans, they want health care and yes. yet their representatives won't they won't do it. And so it's like this is the real nub of, of, of what we need to be talking about in this country. That, that is such a great point, Sean. Like 
really, really important. I think about this in terms of the roads and the infrastructure, right? Because it was like, it's don't tax us because the idea and the implication that's been drawn is that taxes go to welfare, go to black people and brown people, right? That that is the Mm -hmm. line that has been drawn. And um, wealthy people have done that very effectively. And so that like, let's drown, let's drown uh, government in the bathtub, make it so small that we can round and drown in a bathtub. But that has consequences, right? What it has consequences is that the roads are falling apart, the bridges are falling apart, condos are falling down, on and on and on and on, people are dying. And by the way, the costs, the costs of, I think about this all the time, all we're doing is pushing the costs of maintaining your car that blows out of that bends or rim and blows out a tire on the pothole. That's just getting pushed to the consumer, poor people, right? Who, who, who like now your car is falling apart and on and on and on and on. And again, there's more white people in this country than there are anyone else. And that's who's being who that's who's by primarily being hurt by these policies more than anything else, just in terms of sheer numbers anyway. Yeah. White misery is, is the product of all of this. Right. Yeah. I think there was a a school district or it might've even been the whole state of Virginia shut down their schools to prevent desegregation for a year. It's unbelievable. (laughs) And then you saw schools getting shut down for a year at the pandemic and people were just losing their mind. <laughs> right. right. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> They'll right. do it as long as it furthers white supremacy. That's, right. the, that's yeah. almost anything you can think about in this country. It's easy to get it done if it furthers white supremacy. Yeah. 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 Well, I, what I wanted to do is I kind of want to wrap this up. And one of the things that I like to do is turn the mic over to the guest. So you can work it out how you want to work out and uh, <laughs> just tell us about, you know, Give us a promo. Uh, tell us what to expect when we watch your show, and and people that are watching this, you know how how why should they watch your show? Put it that way. I think the best reason for you to watch the radical secular is it really comes down to what kind of world do you want to live in. Uh, what what are your priorities, and do you feel that justice is important? Do you feel that we can build a better world? and that we should be doing that. We should be looking deeply into the issues that we're facing as a, as a civilization, existential issues. And I think the purpose of our show is to kind of, on the one hand, it's to wake people up to the sort of threats that we're facing and the dangers, but it's also to talk about how we got here and how we can like how we can get ourselves out of this hole that we've dug for ourselves as a civilization and, and as humans. And I think that the real, the real issue is first do no harm. It's the very beginning of the Hippocratic oath. And in order for us to, in order for us to, to change the way that things are going, we have to take a hard look at why they're going that way and how that happened. And so that involves a a lot of times us focusing on things that you might feel were negative or, or scary, uh, frustrating, but until we get that stuff all out of the way, we're not going to be able to make progress. And so I think that's our, that, that, that is our, our real goal is to, to speak to people who are sick of this shit and want to move forward and, and, and are willing to invest the time an effort to think deeply about these subjects. So that I would, that's, that, that's my pitch. I'd encourage you to watch and we won't disappoint you. Yeah, we sure won't. We sure won't, Sean. And um, <clears throat> I think that anybody who wants to hear two guys talk about Star Trek should definitely sign on. Uh, we do a lot of that. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, we do talk about Star Trek quite a bit, but only because we care about the ideals that are that are embedded in there, right? Which are a lot of what which, what Sean just said, which are uh, ideas of justice. Um, uh, and, and also, and I think what a, one of the o- often overlooked ideas in Star Trek is the idea of personal development, right? The idea of the Mm -hmm. individual becoming a better person, growing, uh, expanding horizons, right? Like that is a lot of what we try to do for as individuals, 
as Sean and Christoph, like as individuals together as a, as, as a, as a team and as friends, but also as individuals. And also I hope that sort of bleeds through into the show. And I think, um, there's that one woman and she has, um, and she does the thing, uh, where she has, she's teaching a class and she has everybody raised their, everybody who would like to be treated the way black people are treated in the United States to raise their hand and nobody raises their hand. Right. And I bring that up because everybody who is a thinking person and even people who don't know that there's something off here, right? We know that we don't have enough money. We, we see the homeless people in the street. We see all these problems. We know they're real. We know they're there. Most of the time, most of the people who are able to listen to this show probably don't have to deal with those issues personally every single day, right? Um, we're here to tell you why you should, right? We're here to tell you why um, why you should sign up for this project of moving our planet, our civilization towards something just. And if for no other reason, because the planet is on fire, right? So if there's no other reason, we talk about climate change, our third uh, guest, our part-time host, his name is Joe Acapinti, and he does work and he, is, uh, he really hits up a lot of the sort of environmental uh, justice issues that we talk about as well. So look, if you're interested in, 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 I think an entertaining show, uh, a show that is, um, that's sort of fun to listen to that is, and also we have, um, we have a blog, we have a, we call it the journal. We have writings and we put those out every week. Check those out. Radicalsecular.com, uh, the radicalsecular.com. And, uh, you know, and so show up, listen to us. Um, and one of these days we're going to have Doug on, and so you're definitely going to want to listen to that. So, um, so uh, I'm just really definitely, grateful, to, definitely. really grateful to be here, Doug. Okay. Well, Sean, Christoph, thank you both for your time today, and it was a very lively discussion. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll have the links and everything to the show and in the show notes. And uh, I, again, I appreciate uh, you joining me today. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. You can check out more information, including links to sources used, in our show notes on our website at secularleft.us. Secular Left is hosted, written, and produced by Doug Berger, and he is solely responsible for the content. Send us your comments, either using the contact form on the website or by sending us a note at comments at secularleft.us. Our theme music is Dank and Nasty, composed using Amplify Studio. See you next time. The Radical Secular Podcast is written and produced by Christoph Defoe, Sean Prophet, Joe Okapinti, and Drew Scott. Artwork and design by Tim Stetner. Post-production and theme music by Sean Prophet. Special thanks to our support team, Lindsay Brightman, Jillian Sky Jacobs, and Lori Field Okapinti. Okay.